All right, well, good morning, everyone. Let's stand up and let's sing. shackles breaking free hear the song Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. He has risen. One more time. He has risen. 
He has risen indeed. Amen, amen. Well, welcome to Mid-Atlantic Community Church, the Mac. Why don't you all say hello to each other really, really quick? Okay, that's enough. Just kidding. Keep going. Say hello. And then we'll continue to worship. Shame when I found to know 
to life again and I was made for more so why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way I know I am yours and I was made for more Father we praise you this morning we were made for more Lord Amen we praise you on this day of resurrection God that Jesus you are alive this morning Father alive in our hearts God today we thank for that sacrifice and the raising Lord on that third day today let our hearts be open to you and to your word today, Father. Just bless and know as he comes to just give you his testimony, which is awesome, Lord. Just can't wait to hear it again, Father. Watch over him and his heart and Joe's heart as he goes after him. We just praise you and give you this day, give you this Easter, Lord. We thank and we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated this morning. Good morning, church. Welcome. Thank you all so very much for... Being with us here this morning, uh, our 8 o'clock service, don't forget from here on out, we're going to have an 8 o'clock service, so you can join us every week at 8 o'clock now. Yeah, you can clap for that. I'm excited for that. Well, every year during our sunrise service, which has always been at 7, we always have someone share a testimony, but since we're doing the 8 o'clock service now, we thought it'd be fine to have uh, uh, that happen here as well, and so I'm really excited to share with you my friend Anuj. Anuj, if you'll just come forward uh, and to hang out with us. Um, we, we, me and Anuj have become friends and we met each other in uh, some very interesting circumstances. And, and, and when somebody shares their story, it's, a, it's about how they came to know the Lord and the circumstances in which that happened and how the Lord is using them. So we're gonna hear from Anuj this morning. Brother, thank you so much for being here with us. Let's pray. Oh, Father God. We thank you so much for your word, and we thank you so much for your people. Lord, we see your glory in every story, and Lord, we're just so grateful for how you use us. Lord, I just pray that you would use Anuj this morning to share of just how rich your gospel is. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, church. He has risen. Let me first start off by saying it's an honor to be here um, on the day our Lord and Savior was resurrected. Um, my testimony is a story of rebirth. I just did this at seven, so I may have less tears than I did then. Bear with me, please. I grew up uh, in a house of two immigrant parents from India. My parents, especially my mother, were devout Hindus. Education and hard work were instilled into me at a young age. When I was growing up, I was always looking for an identity. And when I couldn't find one, I ended up rebelling. I turned my attention to drugs, drinking, fighting, and skipping school. And as a result, I was shipped off to Fork Union Military Academy. I ended up attending the University of Southern California, but after 366 days, I partied my way out of there. I ended up graduating from Maryland and then going to law school at the University of Baltimore. I like to believe that I was a pretty good lawyer, but looking back at things, it's clear that I developed a God complex, go figure. I was living the life, money, cars, status, drinking drugs, I thought I had the perfect life. And then my real first tragedy hit. I was engaged and then promptly disengaged after about a month. That was the first time I ever had my heart broken and the world seemed to end around me. To rebound, I sucked myself into more trivial things, more money, faster cars, more women, more status. My motto in life changed to work hard, but party, hardy, party harder. I promised myself I would never get hurt in love again. In July of 2014, I met a woman. She lived in South Carolina, but we met here in Baltimore. After five weeks of getting to know each other, she tells me that her parents 
were the ones to sue my very first clients when I had my own law practice three years before. What were the odds, right? I thought this was divine intervention, a doing of God's will. So what was I supposed to do? I proposed. We were married in April of 2016. Around the same time, I was appointed to serve as a commissioner for the county, and I had my own law practice at the same time. The person who went to get me appointed to this commission had been working for the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation for three years before. And after I was appointed, he approached me and handed me $1,000. And I asked him what this was for, and he said, for doing a good job. Now, this only fed my ego, and it fed my need for power, my need for money, my need for greed. He went on to give me two other $1,000 payments, so a total of $3,000. On January 5th, mind you, six months after being married, there was a loud pounding at my door at about 6 a.m. I was startled, and I went and I grabbed my gun. My wife pleaded with me to put the gun away and just go see who answered the door, and by the grace of God, I did that, because when I opened the door, there were three FBI agents, six SWAT team members, and they were about to use a battering ram to open the door. And it was right then and there I was arrested in my underwear in the freezing cold, the dogs barking, my wife yelling and screaming at me. As I was awaiting my trial, the Maryland bar took away my law license. I had to shut down my law practice and I lost my main source of income. My anxiety intensified. Drinking and drugs helped, but never solved the problem. I was facing a bribery charge. One day, my, um, in, in the midst of all this anxiety, my wife told me to get off my rear and try to figure out a way to resolve this matter. And if any of you know lawyers or are a lawyer, you know we try our darndest to get other people, let alone ourselves, out of trouble. We filed a motion to dismiss, and uh, the court basically said, yeah, we're really not gonna go forward with these bribery charges, but didn't dismiss the charges. So three days later, the FBI called me into their office with my lawyer and, and um, said that we're gonna dismiss the bribery charges, but we're gonna re-indict you for a violation of the Travel Act. The Travel Act says, if you cross state lines in the furtherance of a commission of a crime, you are guilty. I had dinner with the FBI informant in Washington, D.C., so that's the only reason why I was being re-indicted. The FBI wanted seven years of my life. The maximum sentence for that charge was five years. So I had no choice. I had to plead guilty in open court, which I did. And the judge ended up giving me a two-year prison sentence and a $50,000 fine. Now, I'm not standing before you to tell, proclaiming or justifying my actions. I'm proclaiming that what I did was wrong. There's no doubt about it. Now, in October of 2017, before I was um, to be put into prison, my mother passed away. And by the grace of God, um, he allowed me to be by her side when that happened. On June 18, 2018, I. I voluntarily entered the Federal Correctional Institute of Morgantown. The day, day I entered that facility, I was fraught with anxiety and despair. This was gonna be my home for the next 18 months. I thought that I didn't belong there, but I knew I had to do my time in order to get back to my life. I was in prison with drug dealers and fraudsters. I didn't think I had anything in common with these men. It was a huge change for me. I felt like I was in hell. In prison, 
The first rule is to mind your own business and keep your head down. Mind you, you're trying to coexist with 900 other men, and that's not easy. I worked in the kitchen, and there was one inmate in particular that I did not have a good relationship with. We did not see eye to eye. We came from two different backgrounds and had nothing in common. His name is Adam Hathorn, and his nickname was Bathtub Jesus. Now, I had a growing disdain for this man because he preached the gospel, and I thought he was full of it. I thought he was obnoxious and without any merit, and that made me hate him that much more. With about six months left in my sentence, Bathtub Jesus came to me and, and said, word for word, sued, God spoke to me and wanted me to share this with you. Now, as a non-believer and being stuck in prison, you kind of often entertain things that you normally wouldn't do. I couldn't run and escape this guy, so I listened to him. He proceeded to share John 14, 6 and 7 with me. And if you don't know this verse, it reads, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, I thought this guy was literally crazy at the time. I had no idea what to make of this verse. I just thought he was nuts. And went back to daydreaming of the day that I would get out of prison. But something from that moment changed. Adam and I actually be started becoming friends. We started listening to each other's stories, learning about one another, finding things in common. He was a New England Patriots fan. I'm a Washington Redskins fan. He was used to winning. I was used to losing. He would continue to share the gospel with me, and I really never understood what he was, he was saying. I just entertained it. <clears throat> Adam ended up being released about a month before I, I was. We swapped phone numbers. We, we stayed in touch with one another, but um, distantly. On December 19, 2019, I was released from prison, and now I'm back home to my life and my wife. I thought everything was going to work out for the best, but then COVID hit. And despite sticking with me, my marriage fell apart. On May 1st, 2021, my wife left me. I haven't seen her since. I take full responsibility for our divorce. I failed her as a husband and as a man. I never wanted to get a divorce. I beg for her forgiveness and I pray for her every day. But this is where the story gets good, guys. On December 22nd, 2021, I got a letter from the Attorney General of Maryland. And in that letter, it said that he was indicting me for stealing $15 million between 2013 and 2015. Now, I was dumbfounded and in shock. And honestly, I had to do a double take to my bank account to look for this $15 million. I mean, I didn't understand how the state could prosecute me for money I never took. My anxiety levels started to increase. To this point, mind you, I'm a convicted felon. I'm divorced, recently divorced, and now I'm being indicted for something that I didn't do. I have no family in the area. It's just me and my dog, and God bless his soul. In October of 2022, my trial starts, and after two weeks of the trial, the judge said that I had stolen this money. He wanted to sentence me right then and there. I was in actual disbelief. My world started falling apart all over again. When I got home that night after the trial or after the verdict, I drank a fifth of scotch just to try to dull the pain. And over the next several months, I, can, 
I continued to drink heavily. Um, I, I was suffering from a whirlwind of fear, anxiety, and misery. My original sentence was set for March 17th, but due to the scheduling conflict, my lawyer is Irish. And for those of you who don't know, March 17th is St. Patrick's Day. He magically had a conflict. My sentence was moved to April 7th, 2023. And those who don't remember last year, April 7th was Good Friday. Now, after uh, March 17th, I met with my lawyer, I believe it was on the 18th or 19th. And I asked him, how much time am I facing? And he said, I don't know. And I said, what do you mean you don't know? He goes, well, the difference between those cases or, or other theft cases that he's dealt with in my case is that those people actually took something. Now, that conversation actually led me into um, a pretty bad tailspin. I didn't have the answers. He couldn't tell me how much time I was facing. The maximum sentence of the charge is 30 years. So my mind started racing. It was about that time I wanted to end my own life. I just couldn't take it anymore. I wanted to check myself into a mental hospital just to get through the sentencing period. Now, at the time, as a non-believer, I did not realize I was already dead. But something was about to change. Ephesians 2 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. On March 21st, 2023, 32123, I was nursing a pretty mean hangover and I was contemplating ways to end my life. I was, um, I didn't have the courage to do it. Instead, I fell to my knees and I started yelling and screaming at God. I wanted him to take the pain away. I wanted him to take my life. That's when God spoke to me. He told me, give me all your pain, troubles, and struggles, my son. When I tell you, my entire body started tingling, the hairs on my body raised, my crying turned to tears of joy. When I rose to my feet, I could feel the Holy Spirit starting to grow within me. I shared this message with a dear friend and a sister at the MAC. She helped me begin exploring what this means. We fell on Lamentations 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, which reads, yes, this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Later that evening, I received a phone call from an unknown number. And this is how the exact conversation went. Hello? Hey, Sue, this is Adam. 
God told me to give you a call and check in on you. It all made sense right at that moment. Tears of joy began to fall down my face. He told me that the reason I hadn't heard from him in a while is because he had gone into the ministry and that he just finished his studies a few days before. God bless. I stand here before you today knowing that Jesus placed Adam into my life to help deliver me to Christ. We exchange scripture and words of encouragement on a daily basis, from enemies to friends to now brothers in Christ. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by the grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. From that very moment, from March 21st, 2023, I vowed to devote the rest of my life to serving God. On the day of the sentencing, Good Friday, so two weeks have passed, Good Friday, the day Christ was nailed to the cross. The very first thing out of the judge's mouth was, the state failed to prove a loss. My lawyer turned to me and said, why did he find you guilty in the first place? And I'm going, I pay you for that answer, buddy. Now I stand before you promising that if I had stolen anything, I wouldn't be here today, let alone $15 million. I didn't serve any jail time, and I wasn't ordered to pay any restitution. Following this persecution, my mentor, friend, and, and brother Craig Corbin shared 2 Corinthians 12.10 with me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I've been asked how has my faith changed since I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. This has been the most difficult challenge in this exercise for me. This is all new to me. The old me was vain, full of himself, dead in sin. I was riddled with anxiety because I was fearful of the unknown. Situations would get me easily angered, like driving around the beltway. <laughs> but becoming a humbler man would have been impossible without the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working in my life and placing me on a path of sin and despair without delivering bathtub Jesus into my life. On April 30th, 2023, I was baptized here at the MAC. Over the past year, I've grown into my faith, but I also know that the rest of my God-given life, I need to continue to grow. I've been lucky for such great support from Pastor Joe, Pastor Dion, Pastor Jim, Pastor Dave, Pastor Lou, the, the countless people that have shown love, support, and given me prayers. I can't thank everyone enough. But as the spirit grows within me, I'm slowly beginning to find my purpose in life. I feel an innate feeling to share the word of our Savior to share with the world that they too can be saved if they just stay still and listen. I'm working on being more humble. My road rage when merging onto Route 50 isn't as bad anymore. My anxiety has been lessened, all because Jesus has me. 
I just try to stay, be still and listen to what God is trying to tell me. Things are just a little simpler. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not standing before you proclaiming that all is right. I stand before you admitting that I am a sinner. I will continue to sin. The difference now is that I recognize my sin and I'm trying every day to reduce the amount of sin by repenting my sin to prevent Satan from overtaking my life. I'm trying to be closer to Jesus. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my testimony. Thanks, brother. Anuja and I met when my friend Christy texted me and she said, hey, I need you to meet this guy. And when Anush came into my office and we sat and hung out with each other, all that stuff that he just said to you, I mean, he just was knee deep. And he was in the moment uh, of the second trial where he uh, didn't know whether he was going to jail for the rest of his life or not. But at that point, he had accepted Jesus. And I remember us wrestling with each other and talking and praying and his confidence that if this is what the Lord wants for him to, to be a believer and go to jail and to serve in that manner, he was so willing. That's when you know somebody's got a hold of the Lord, uh, got the, the Lord has a hold of their heart is when in the midst of incredible pain and trial, they're willing to say whatever you need from me, Lord. Uh, Anuj has been a great friend and a, a wonderful man. A lot of people don't know, but Anuj shows up every week here at the church, and he just serves. He shows up and is just like, what do you need from me today? Him and Kevin have become fast friends. They're constantly running around the building, fixing things and doing things. And uh, even at the first service, the 7 o'clock service, um, a young man named Dennis came and uh, was at the service because Anuj was like, let me share my story with you. So you, you see how God uses somebody's story. And this isn't some great comeback from Anuj. This was God's plan. God knew all along. And even what man intended for evil, God purposed for good. And not only Anuj's life, but in Adam, bathtub Jesus' life. He would so desperately wanted to be here this morning, but he's actually preaching at a church this morning. How good is our God? You know, in the Old Testament, the people in their sin used to have to take a lamb and, and, and it was their best lamb and they would bring it to the high priest. And there's this massive temple. And there were certain places where only certain people could go. And if you were just a regular old person, uh, you couldn't even get in the temple. And then there were priests within the temple and they would, some of them would do the sacrifices, but yet there's this one priest, the high priest. Now this priest was the only priest that could get in this room called the Holy of Holies. It's this massive 60 foot curtain, probably about 30 foot wide, four inches thick. And this high priest was the only one who could go into this room because we learn in the Old Testament that this room was God's presence. They put the Ark of the Covenant there and this room was a symbol for holiness. And so only the high priest could therefore offer the sacrifices before the Lord in this holy of holies separated by this curtain. Now, I think that's what Anuj and all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, experience separation. Separation from a holy God. And it's interesting that we try to turn to the things of this world, but yet those things always fail us. The Romans it teaches us, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. None of us can enter into God's presence anymore, enter Jesus, Jesus, God, 
who came to this earth. And what the word says, he came not to be served, but to serve us and be a ransom for us. When we think about Easter, Jesus dying on the cross, there's an amazing, symbolic, beautiful moment on the cross. Jesus cries out, it is finished. And as he cries that out, the earth begins to quake, the word says. In the King James Version, it says the sun fails. The earthly sun stops shining in that moment. It's covered. Darkness everywhere. And if you look at Mark 15, Jesus says, into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit. And the curtain of the temple is torn in two from the top to the bottom. Interestingly enough, in that moment, a centurion, a soldier, one who might have whipped him, one who might have pierced his hands, one who might have speared him, one who might have mocked him or gambled for his clothes, one who might have put that crown of thorns on his head, cries out, truly, this man was the son of God. This wasn't a comeback for Jesus. This was the plan all along. Man separated from God. Jesus' desire to bring us back into relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This room that only the high priest could go into to offer for the sacrifice of our sins, this room has now been opened to all. The curtain torn from the top to the bottom. Only God could tear that. This room, this presence of God, His holiness has now been offered to us. That when we believe and put our faith in Him, no longer are we separated. In Hebrews, where Paul is teaching the church, and, and he quotes Jesus, and he says, uh, Jesus says to his father, God, God, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Jesus says, Behold, I have come to do your will. See, Jesus does away with the first in order to establish the second. Jesus says there's a new way now. It's a way in which that we will be sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. No longer will every priest stand daily at the service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which never could take away sins anyway. But when Christ offered for all a single sacrifice for sin, it was finished. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus wasn't saying it was finished, his life is over, it's done. No, Jesus knew he was coming back three days later. He's saying the work that his father set before him was finished. That's why the curtain tore. No more separation. Hebrews goes on and he says, Therefore, we have confidence to enter the holy place. By the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way, he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In the Old Testament, the high priest would have been in fear going into that holy of holies. Matter of fact, they would have tied a rope with a bell to his leg so that if, if that bell stopped ringing, it meant he was dead. 
because he had sinned and entered in the presence of God. They would pull him out. They entered God's presence with fear. Now Paul says because of the work of Jesus, we get to enter the presence of God, his holiness, with confidence. Confidence knowing that Jesus did the work. It truly is finished. And Anuj couldn't have said it any better. From this point, we are called to follow the word of God. Live a life of repentance, realizing we all have fallen short of that glory. And Jesus is the only one who has done the work. And no longer are you separated from that love. Amen, church? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for a nudge, and I thank you for his story. Lord, I thank you for Adam, and I pray for that dear brother this morning as he preaches the gospel to the church Lord, would you use him and continue to use his story? Watch over him. I pray for Dennis, Lord, and I thank you for that witness of a nudge. Lord, I thank you for, for all that you're doing in the church here today. God, may your word preach and may it speak. And Lord, will your people know they are no longer separated because of the blood of Christ, because of what Jesus did on the cross. Would they know that when they put their heart life in your hands and they believe in you lord they are now yours oh lord this was not a comeback this was the plan in your name we pray amen let me just close with romans 8 35 and the question is asked what shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress Shall persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword, as is it written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor, or nor present things, nor to those things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. We love you, church. Let's celebrate this amazing day together. Have a great day.